there's been great interest in this topic that we're, we're here to talk about this morning, the topic of kindergarten assessment and the, the birth through a third grade continuum. And it is my great pleasure to introduce the moderator for this session, John Pruitt. And John will be introducing the remaining esteemed and, accom and accomplished panelist. John Pruitt is the executive director of the Office of Early Le Learning at the, Depart the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. And this is the, the office that really focuses in North Carolina on the, the pre-K to third grade continuum. And John leads that effort in, in bridging that continuum and supporting children's success in the early grades. That this office also partners with the First School Initiative at the Frank Porter Graham uh, Child Development Institute at UNC Chapel Hill and that in promoting public school efforts to really be more responsive to a more diverse school population. And I also happen to know that John was a kindergarten teacher. And I, I, I always appreciate that because I know it grounds him to have that hands-on experience. So John, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning to everyone. Um, happy to see such a full room. Um, I'm wondering if the topic kindergarten entry assessment has brought you into the room. Uh, because when you say those words, um, it can sometimes raise alarms. Uh, it can sometimes make you wonder what, what are we talking about? Is this about high stakes accountability in the early grades? But I think you'll find through this process today that that, that in fact is not what we're talking about. We're talking about um, using assessment. Um, let's see if this is better. Can you hear me now? Yes. Sounds like a phone commercial. Can you hear me now? Um, so what I was saying, as we talk about kindergarten assessment today, I, I, what we want to do is sort of peel back the veil and let you know that we're talking about assessment as a process related to instruction or as a part of instruction. One that actually helps teachers more deeply understand the children that are in their classrooms and how they use that information to better support children across the kindergarten continuum, actually the kindergarten through grade three continuum, uh, to leverage the extraordinary gains that children make in early childhood programs. Um, so with that, um, I'm very privileged uh, to be on the stage with my colleagues. Um, I'll introduce each of them and then they'll each have a part where they'll speak, uh, share information, and then we'll entertain questions. I'll ask questions and then we'll entertain questions from the audience uh, through this process. The first person I'd like to introduce is Catherine Scott Little. I don't think she's um, a stranger to anybody in this room. Uh, she's currently an associate professor in the Department of Human Development and Family Studies at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Uh, she has studied large-scale assessment systems that states have developed to collect data on um, their assessments, uh, including assessing kindergarten children, what, excuse me, um, including assessing kindergarten children, what schools need to know, and assessing the state of state assessments, perspectives on assessing young children. She has also completed several national studies to document the content of state's early learning and development standards and has provided technical assistance regarding standards and assessments to numerous states. Catherine completed her undergraduate degree in child and family development at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro and a doctorate degree in human development at the University of Maryland at College Park. So welcome, Catherine. Margaret Heritage. Margaret serves as a senior scientist at West Ed and as an assistant director at the National Center for Research on Evaluation Standards and Student Testing at UCLA. Her work focuses on data use for school improvement, assessment of English learners, and formative assessment. Her latest book, Formative Assessment and Practice, A Process on Inquiry and Action, is published by Harvard Education Press, and her co-authored book, English Language Learners and the New Standards will be available in May of 2015. Margaret has worked extensively with states in the area of standards and assessment. Current work in this area includes advising North Carolina's development of assessment for kindergarten through third grade, developing teacher evaluation standards, and accompanying professional development for the Nevada Department of Education 
as well as work on assessment literacy for the Colorado Department of Education. So we're very privileged to have you as well. And I was a kindergarten teacher. Right? And a kindergarten teacher, so we shouldn't. Long time ago. <laughs> And then Dr. Rolf Groff Walner. Uh, Rolf is the Assistant State Superintendent of the Division of Early Childhood Development at the Maryland State Department of Education. The division is responsible for state policy and technical support for all early childhood programs serving children birth through kindergarten. Among many initiatives, uh, Dr. Groff Walner was instrumental in 2000 in developing a statewide kindergarten assessment, the first of its kind in the country. He assisted in developing policies for all-day kindergarten for all five-year-olds and the expansion of pre-kindergarten programs to all four-year-olds who are economically disadvantaged. He leads efforts to consolidate all early care and education programs into Maryland State Department of Education, thereby creating a new governance model for early childhood education nationally. And he directed efforts to expand a statewide model of a comprehensive public-private partnership between public schools, early childhood, parenting, and health programs known as the Judy Center Partnerships. Under his leadership, Maryland received the Competitive Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge Grant Award in 2011, whose implementation will define Maryland's early education reform for this decade. Uh, he has 30 years of experience in early childhood education as a teacher, program manager, and state administrator. So we're very happy to have you here as well. Um, as we start this discussion today, we thought it would be interesting for Catherine to sort of give us a national perspective on kindergarten assessment. And so with that, I invite Catherine Scott Little to the podium. Thank you. There's a better way to do that. Uh, I think I can balance it. So good morning, everyone. So I'm just going to set the context by giving you a bird's eye view of what's going on across the country, so across different states, related to kindergarten entry assessment. But first I want to make sure you know what I'm talking about. So the way that I'm defining kindergarten entry assessment is an assessment that's administered to all children in the first few months of kindergarten. It covers multiple domains, and it also meets certain criteria to make sure that it's appropriate for children this age. Um, this is how the federal government defined a kindergarten entry assessment in an, a number of different competitions that they've had. And so that's what I'm talking about. So when you think about that, raise your hand if you think your state has one or is working on one. Okay. So what I'm going to do in giving you just a whirlwind view of what's going on across the country, I'm going to give you a brief history lesson because I think it's important as we think about kindergarten assessment that we kind of remember from whence we come as well as what's going on now. So some trends across states and just a real global view of some similarities and differences of what's going on in kindergarten entry assessment across states. And then I'll end with talking about some challenges that I think a number of states have, have experienced in this area. So first the history lesson. Now you may not have been in the field long enough uh, to have been around in the mid-1980s, but it, the kindergarten entry assessments are not a new thing. So a number of states had kindergarten assessments in the mid-80s, and in fact, 19 um, had statewide ses assessment systems at that point in time. But the difference was, at that point, it was considered an assessment that was done early in kindergarten or before kindergarten and was used to decide could children go to kindergarten. And a number of states had things, assessments at the end of kindergarten to decide could kindergartners go to first grade. So mid-1980s, from whence we come, and perhaps a little bit of that in our background of why we're kind of, as John said, when you hear this word, maybe getting, <laughs> catching our breath a little bit and thinking, oh, what is that? Is it a good thing? So there were in the 80s several position statements, lots of people upset about the misuse of assessment to make decisions about children. And what we saw in the mid 80s in AEYC as well as State Department of Education specialists putting out position statements that said, no, you know, well, let's remember what's the appropriate use of assessments. And as a result, it was kind of like a pendulum. Lots of states had them and certainly lots of districts and then we saw 
a marked decrease in the number of states that had them. The pendulum kind of swung to where almost no one was doing them. And uh, those states that were looking at assessment were really encouraging observational assessment. So that's our history lesson. What we see currently is the pendulum swinging back up with a number of states actually working on or adopting assessment systems for kindergartners. So we see here in the late 90s, it was about 13 in 2010, about 25, and last year about 20, uh, 33. And actually when you put in states that are sort of working toward it, the numbers are more like 40. So lots of states working in this area. But I think what I want you to hear is there's a lot of reasons for this to be really the focus of attention among states now. So there are lots of factors that are playing into this momentum. And as you'll hear later, the pendulum swinging back up, but in a different direction, okay? So a different direction from where we were in the 80s. So there is a lot of interest at the state level among policymakers to know how our kids doing for lots of different reasons. Um, they want to know, they've invested a lot of in, uh, money in early childhood, and so what, how are kids doing when they start kindergarten? But the federal government has also done some things to encourage states to develop these types of assessments in our race to the top competition. You got a lot of points as a state if you wrote to this, and then we have more recently federal enhanced assessment grants done with groups of states, consortia of states, to work on an assessment. And we have two of those represented today. So there's a lot of reasons why states are paying attention to this now. And what we see is there are some variations across states in how they're doing this. So some states, because kindergarten's at the middle of early childhood and K-12, and as a field, we sort of play uh, sometimes push and pull over who owns it. Is it really early childhood or is it really K-12? And sometimes it's sort of like no man, man's land. You know, nobody really takes hold of it. So states have thought about this differently. Some states see their kindergarten entry assessments as an extension of what's going on in the early childhood years. So pre-K up to kindergarten, and it's kind of a culmination. Other states see it as the beginning of K-12, so it's an assessment done at the beginning of kindergarten and it sets the stage for what comes later rather than paying a whole lot of attention to what came before. And then the third approach is really to think of the KEA sort of as a transition process. So not as much about the data, but more about the process, how it facilitates children moving from pre-kindergarten or other experiences into kindergarten. So for this reason, because they've thought about it differently, we see different approaches, and also because there are different purposes. So some states are doing assessment to gain data to kind of look back at early childhood and see where we might have gaps. Other states are really focused on helping kindergarten teachers do instruction. So for these reasons, we see some differences across states, but we see a lot of commonalities. So when you think kindergarten entry assessment, you may not know exactly what a particular state looks like, but here are some things that it's likely to look like. So almost all states are relying on kindergarten teachers as the source of the data that's collected on children. And almost all states now are, when they do the assessment, assessing children across multiple domains. So what that means is, for a while it was just language and literacy and maybe math, but now we're seeing assessments that are holistic. And many are developing their own instrument, but some are using commercially available instruments. But almost all do something in the first two months of kindergarten. So it's an assessment usually done by kindergarten teachers in the first two months. It may look a little different from state to state, but almost all of them address all five domains. But it's not easy work. And I think as you listen to state stories and maybe think about your questions, you'll see that there are a number of challenges with rolling out kindergarten entry assessment systems. So I'm just gonna kind of throw some out there and then you can listen as we hear some state stories as to how some of these challenges are paying, playing out. The first is the time frame. When state policymakers want something, they usually want it yesterday, not 
four years or 10 years down the road, but yesterday. And the federal government's not much different. So these assessments are having to be developed in a fairly quick time frame. They're sort of balancing fit between what's going on in the early childhood world and our early childhood standards and what's going on in K-12. And often teachers and their responses, the kindergarten teachers are saying, wait, I've got a lot already on my plate. This is one more thing to do. And some folks are saying, more assessment, really? We've got way too much of that going on. So there are some challenges around just how it's being received, much less helping teachers do it well. So professional development to administer the assessment, to then use the data to improve instruction. It takes a lot of professional development to do that. So states are kind of, as they develop these assessments, really focusing on what the assessment itself looks like, but also having to think about the kindergarten teachers and supporting them in doing the, the assessment. We also see not, besides just doing the assessment, there's what to do with the data presents a number of challenges. Making sure that the data are credible, that we know we have reliable and valid data, and that it's being put to, into whatever it's being put into accurately is a, a true challenge as well as how it's used at the policy level. You know, making sure that how the data were collected is consistent with how it's being used and it's not being used to, to do things that it wasn't designed to do. And then finally, some challenges around just the assessment process, including children who have a number of different, the federal government calls it high needs, so children with disability, children from low income backgrounds, children who are learning English, that's different from their home language, that presents a number of different challenges, both in terms of the instrument that's used and making sure it's appropriate, as well as no teachers, knowing how to do it appropriately with these children, and then how to interpret the data. What does it mean if certain groups of children are scoring lower on certain things? So those are some challenges, and then finally, there's some missed opportunities around families, and quite honestly, a number of states, it's such a big challenge to even get the assessment up and running that I think we want to include parents, but you know how to do that in this first effort um, may not have gotten as much attention as I think it will down the road. And so I think states are thinking about how not to miss the opportunity to include families as important partners in the process. So that kind of sets the stage for where we came from, so we've got a history, we're swinging in a new direction. This is not, for by and large across most states, the same thing. It is more in the line of what's developmentally appropriate for children and useful for teachers, but there are a lot of challenges with how do we do this well. So I am going to pull up Margaret's presentation. Good morning. I can tell I'm with early childhood people because you say good morning back, which is really nice. <laughs> so many audiences, you say good morning and they grunt. So thank you for <laughs> saying good morning. Um, so my title uh, today is Moving Beyond Can Do It, Can't Do It. And I want to give a perspective on assessment because it seems to me that we have to make lemonade out of the hand we've been dealt. And in making lemonade from this basket of lemons, I want to suggest that we need to move beyond thinking about children as they can do something or they can't do something. And if I were you, um, you know, and as, a, as I mentioned earlier, I did teach kindergarten a gazillion years ago. I don't have the energy to do it now, I have to tell you, but uh, many years ago I did. And the idea of giving students an assessment would be really problematic for me. Um, I, you know, I'll, be, I'll be quite honest with you, and I'm sure many of you are in that place where you're thinking this is not, you know, we, we assess children in specific ways in, in our preschool classrooms, our environments, and this doesn't feel right. And I'm not going to ask you if it feels right uh, to you or not, but 
certainly years ago it wouldn't have felt right to me. And I think one of the reasons is because of this perspective of assessment that basically gives you an achievement measure. Children can do something or they can't do it. And even worse, in some of our earlier manifestations of assessment in the K-12 arena, children will be labeled as basic, below basic, proficient, and, and so on. And none of those labels are very helpful, I don't think, to teachers in classrooms in terms of helping children grow and develop in ways that are positive, right from where they are to where they need to go next. And so I want to suggest an approach for us to think about, and I'm happy to say this is an approach that North Carolina certainly thought about, and I've been very impressed and uh, really quite delighted with the approach that I think John's going to talk about um, more specifically in a minute. Uh, well, actually, in eight minutes, to be, to be truthful, <laughs> if I stay on time. Um, so if we think about learning, it's not a case of you learn it and then you've got it or you haven't got it. Learning, you know about children. You know that children grow, they change, they develop as a result of experiences, instruction, of nurturing, nourishment. You know that children change and grow. So they just don't transform from one state to another state overnight. And I think that's how we have to think about learning. I mean, learning by definition involves progression. And so what you've got here is a, a heuristic, if you like, for thinking about growth and development, about learning, that it starts from early seeds, that children come into this world, they have experiences, they develop, and they develop further and further and further, and their development gets more sophisticated. They're able to do more things physically. They're more in control of themselves. Cognitively, they, they develop. So from these early beginnings, as a result of the support and guidance we provide, along with their parents, they grow. They change. And what we need to find out, I think, is where children are on this growth pathway so that we can help them move forward. So it's not a case if you're stuck here. You're labeled as you can't do this or you can do it. But where are you on this continuum of development? Where are you on this progression? So that I, as your teacher or your parent, your guardian, can help you take the next step in development. And it's a constant continuum. And if you think about this all the way through um, preschool through 12th grade, that what you're doing in the early years will lay a foundation that gets built on progressively as children move through the formal years of schooling. And so that's where I think as we need to place our, th our notions about assessment in terms of growth and development as a progression. And that somebody, any child, is somewhere along that progression. And what is your job as a teacher, an educator, a guide? It's to help that child move to what is the next possible step that the child can take. And that is what I think we need to be thinking about with assessment. And if assessment does that for us, then it's a good thing. It really is very tasty lemonade, as opposed to that basket of lemons that some of you might feel you've been dealt. Um, so if we think about learning and as uh, assessment in a way that supports learning and, and development, and as Catherine said, um, many states, including North Carolina, are thinking much more holistically about children. And um, so by learning, I mean all facets of learning, the social-emotional learning, the cognitive learning, the physical learning. If we want assessment to support learning, then it seems to me assessment has to be able to answer three main questions. And this, these three main questions come from a large literature on formative assessment. So thinking about testing not as a status measure, an achievement measure, but where are children right now in their learning? And I had a yoga teacher once, and I used to keep going back to her, because she would tell me, whatever I did, wherever you are is perfect. And I felt so good that I'd keep on going back because it's one of the very few occasions when I've been referred to as perfect, I can tell you. Um, so this notion of wherever you are is wherever you are, and that's perfect. But my job is to move you from where you are to where you can go next. And so here are the questions. 
The students and the teacher and the parents need to know, where am I going? What's the goal? What's that progression? What is that trajectory? What does it look like when I'm making that growth? So where am I headed? Where am I going? And this is what assessment needs to answer. Not can you do it or can't you do it, but where are you now? As a result of all your experiences in life and school and family, where are you now on that progression? And then if it's a progression, it will help teachers answer the question, where to next? Because that's what learning is about. Where can I go to from where I, are, I am to what it's possible for me to do next with the guidance and assistance of adults and my peers? And if assessment can't answer those questions, then to me it's not a lot of use to the profession. And if it's not a lot of use to you in the profession, I'm not sure who it's useful for. I mean, I could get into lots of big fights with people about that, but I'm with you today, so I'll, I'll, I'll just say it and leave it. So these are these core questions. Where am I going? What's my trajectory? Where am I now? And where to next? And we've got K-12 standards, we know where our kids are going. Certainly in the core areas of the curriculum, it's interesting that once you get into kindergarten or certainly into primary, your social emotional development sorted, so we don't have to worry about that anymore. Um, it's always amazing to me that you know, we just focus on the academic areas. But anyway, having said that, uh, the idea that we know the trajectory, we know the pathway, we've got standards, we have a progression and kids will be somewhere along that progression. And so we need to think about the, the, the preschool um, and the students that you're responsible for as part of that longer continuum, that they're on the way to be college and career ready. And so where am I going, where am I now, where to next? Does that make sense to you in terms of questions that you, you would want assessment to be helping you answer? And so when we're thinking about this, and this is a, a theory of action um, for how assessment in the way I've conceptualized it just now might support um, answering those three questions. So if we have a learning progression, and by that I mean what, what's the early manifestations of development or cognition? What does it look like in those very early stages? And then what are those shifts along the way that children make as a result of experience and, and schooling? So that progression, and then we need assessments that are mapped to that learning progression. And when I'm talking about assessments here, I'm not talking about a thing. I'm not talking about an event. To me, and I'm not just currying favor with you because you're you know, you're here and I'm here. You are the best assessors of your children. You understand where they come from, you understand their context, you understand who they are, minute by minute, day by day. You are the best assessors of children. So what I would like to be thinking about is how can we support you uh, as teachers or people who support teachers to be able to be attuned to how to gather evidence of learning along that continuum from real authentic places in your classroom, real authentic tasks. So what are those tasks? What are those opportunities that are mapped to a progression? So you can answer that question, where am I now? Where is my, are my students now? And so the progression helps you interpret. So you're, you're watching, you're talking, you're questioning you're listening, and you're making some judgments about what is this telling me about where my, this particular child is on this progression based on the descriptions you have uh, from the pro progression. And so you're getting useful information. And if people want to turn that into accountability information, so be it. But par of paramount importance is its utility for those who work day by day with the children. And so our theory of action in this particular framework is that the assessments that are aligned to a learning progression will increase the teacher's knowledge in terms of what does this domain look like? You know, it's not just social development, but let's look at the instantiations of social development as children progress 
through their schooling experience. And then we collect evidence of that student learning. And what does that evidence, what's that last question I had? Where am I going? Where to now? Where am I now? Where to next? Because that's where you get responsive instruction. If we have a KEA, it should be useful for teachers. It should give teachers some real insights into who their students are in those first days of schooling so they can act on that information and take children to where they can go to next. Otherwise, it seems to me it's not a whole lot of use. Um, teachers can engage in responsive instruction. As Frederick Froebel said, that very famous early child person, watch the child, he will show you the way to go, or something like that. Uh, that may be a... You know, but that's a general sentiment. Watch the child, he will show you the way to go. And so making it rigorous, evidence mapped to a progression which teachers then interpret and respond. And as Catherine said earlier, all of this is going to be dependent on strong professional development. To understand the progression, to become skillful at attending to children and then acting on that evidence. And this is something that's a lifelong, I mean, I've been working in education longer than I'm willing to confess to, but this is a lifelong journey. And so teachers get better knowledge of the domain, they get more skilled at noticing and acting on evidence, as long as that professional su uh, development supports them. And then the outcome for students is that students become aware of their own learning. It's perfectly possible for students to understand, yeah, th this is where I am and this is where I need to go next and that they become responsive. So in the end, student learning moves forward. But the key to this, uh, as I see it, is that assessment must answer those three questions, and to do that, it has to be grounded in some kind of progression of learning so that we can identify where our students are and know what we need to do next to advance their learning. And as I said earlier, my yoga teachers used to say, wherever you are is perfect. And I think we can say that for our children coming in. It's not that you can't do something. Here's where you are, and it's perfect for now. And that for now is going to move the students on to a new place, because that's our job, to keep moving them and developing them in ways that are manageable and accessible and supportive to the students. So wherever you are is perfect for now. Well, good morning. I don't have a PowerPoint, uh, but I'm going to tell you a story uh, of um, this whole journey that Margaret was just referring to. And it, for me personally, it's been a 15-year journey, and so I'll keep it short. I have about eight minutes left to tell you what happened in Maryland. In 1999, uh, there was a surplus in our Maryland um, budget. And there were a lot of people knocking at the door, legislators and at the governor's office to say, what can we do with the surplus money? What kind of gaps do we need to address? Early childhood was one area that was at the top. But the legislator said before we invest millions and millions in early childhood education, we need to know whether our kids are doing well as a result of that intervention or those supports. So they came to the State Department of Education and said, you just gonna give us some kind of measure that will tell us how these kids are doing. And we give you six months to do this. <laughs> so we um, uh, didn't really want to move, but I think politically there was no way out of this box, and so we basically uh, moved in the direction of what we had done before. Our approach in the previous five years has been to work on formative assessment, that means some kind of assessment mode you use in the, in, uh, um, in the classrooms, or even among family childcare providers, and using a tool that was then available called Work Sampling System, 
And we looked at that and said, well, can we do something with it that would give us some information that would help um, those folks, policymakers or administrators and others that have a vested interest in the benefits of young children and would like to work on changing the infrastructure and the system in early childhood that would support kids, not each child at a time, but as groups of children and in general um, close the achievement gap that was at that time sort of an emerging issue. So we were of course coming in from the education perspective and we were touting these notions of what Margaret has been saying just now about what is valuable to the teacher. That's where it starts. When we're talking about readiness for school or readiness for kindergarten, that's where the dynamic is, is the relationship between the teacher and the child. How can we then operationalize it to the point where they can clean information that's necessary for them, for their work in the classroom, but also give us information so that we can report on groups of kids. And so in 2001, we started our first census administration of what was then the assessment component of an early learning framework that we developed called Maryland Model for School Readiness. And what was in there, what had to be in there, is that it a multi-dimensional kind of assessment that promotes instruction, best practices in supporting young children's learning, then engage families in that process of uh, learning, and then finally have a broad-based professional development built in so that all teachers and preschool teachers, including those from Head Start and Child Care, can participate in learning about practices that support the readiness of kids in these areas that we have identified. And those were social and personal development, physical development and health, and then some of the cognitive areas such as language literacy, math, um, social studies and the science. So we did this for 13 years. We reported out on that information and the teachers used the information in the classroom during the first few months, that basically the first quarter of the month, I mean the year, the school year, that been through uh, early November. They reported that information to us, we reported out on groups and subgroups, and then we sent that information back to all the provider groups, our councils, local councils. We sent it to the business group. We sent it to the administrators of child care programs, Head Start programs. And we worked with them as to what that data tells us, how we interpret it in terms of what we need to do in the field to support kids. Give you an example of what happened in the first few years. A child care resource and referral agency had noted that there was really a need to do more preschool science with these kids that that was really an area that was uh, slowly disappearing in the classrooms. And so they took it on to take that as a campaign to their early childhood providers to promote um, preschool science. Then there were activities that are used within Head Start or within pre-kindergarten programs where curricular decisions were made to some extent on what can the data tell us what we need to emphasize in our classrooms. And since it was multidimensional, it also introduced things that typically were not emphasized in kindergarten, and that was the social foundation component, the social and personal needs. And so we were able to tell a story about that to our community and have them um, work with, with the information and also uh, introduce some interventions that would support kids. That was at that level. But the teacher, of course, as you just heard from Margaret, would use the information for instructional purposes. It would identify gaps and it would involve them in the instructional process to support these kids along these learning progressions that were just mentioned. But then a shift happened in about 2010 that we needed to really tune in on. The Common Core was just developed in a lot of local school systems. We have 24 of them in, this, in, in Maryland. We're looking at 
improving their standards in their curriculum in the uh, K-12 arena. We also then uh, developed something for pre-K that would line up with the Common Core. And we personally felt that the Common Core was uh, considerably better, stronger, and more developmentally appropriate for our children that our uh, Maryland state curriculum uh, has been, which was mostly focused on, on literacy and early reading and foundational skills in reading and math. And so we really saw an opportunity here to do something that we pedagogically felt was very important. And now I'm speaking a little bit about the formative process of assessment that um, Margaret was referring to that I think in the common core arena is going to have a better place. To start out by working on, on ways in how you introduce topics to kids to get them to think about um, certain problems, start to discuss how to solve those problems, and then how they start their day by planning certain activities, going through the activities, and then reflect on the activities that are done. These are some of these elements that we find in the introduction of the Common Core and the support that's uh, provided by CCSSO and some other organizations that would really help us to get that across with our um, early childhood community. So what we have done before by developing professional development modules and engaging kindergarten and pre-kindergarten and uh, Head Start teachers on some of these best practices is something that we had to redefine. And at that time, we were able to get the race to the top and we also redefined our assessment. So we um, have been in, uh, engaged over the last three years in developing an assessment that has a formative component. So teacher, for instance, works with a child, notice that there are certain things they need to stress with the child. There are some um, potential learning needs that need to be addressed so that that formative assessment really is something you use every day, almost on, an, on, an, on a daily basis with the child. We're not talking about benchmarking, we're just talking about using formative assessment along a learning progression to see where the child is and what you need to do as a next step to bring that child along, um, you know, along some learning progression that we've lined up with our um, curricular framework in, in Maryland. And then there is a component, a snapshot, if you will, in the beginning of kindergarten where we established a kindergarten readiness assessment that looks at 28 learning progressions across four domains of learning and that are then being aggregated for the state, for the county, and for the school. The teacher would then provide us the information and we can report it out to a community that has a vested interest in improving the conditions for uh, learning opportunities for young kids. And so we just completed the first year census administration in Maryland in the fall of this KRA, and we're working on enhancing it through another grant that uh, we do as part of a consortium with seven other states, similar to what North Carolina is engaged in, and then work with those states to, on assessment issues, uh, both for the formative as well as for the KRA, and then have that established uh, by 2016-17. So, in the nutshell, this has been uh, a process that we have gone through. We have had a lot of experience with this. I really um, appreciate Margaret's point of view as to what it is, what is beneficial to the teacher, is beneficial to the child in terms of assessment. And that is the, the, the focus, of course, in the classrooms. And it really feel very strongly that it ought to be done across the board not only with our pre-kindergarten programs, but with our three-year-olds and two-year-olds to have a good understanding as to how the kids develop and what the teacher can do to support them as a next step in their development and in their learning. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. Um, I have a 
brief presentation to talk about North Carolina's vision, um, but in some ways I kind of hate to take down that slide um, because I think it's just so perfect um, <laughs> as a descriptor for, for, for what we should believe about children uh, because it really is our role to understand children and to help them move forward. Um, <clears throat> So let me get to my place, and I will talk about North Carolina. Okay. So, um, We've heard a lot about assessment, uh, kindergarten entry assessment, informative assessment. Uh, I want to frame this a little bit for North Carolina because I know this is probably a North Carolina heavy um, room uh, in terms of participants. And just speak to um, how we came to a place in North Carolina to, to be creating a kindergarten entry assessment. Um, as it was mentioned, um, the Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge Grant had a competitive priority uh, that you could write to that was about creating a statewide kindergarten entry assessment for, for statewide implementation. And North Carolina sat down and envisioned about that because we really thought that this could be a way uh, to introduce a process of assessment not only in kindergarten but across the grades one, two, and three to really help teachers get a, gain a deeper understanding of children. Um, we were funded through that grant um, and given a significant amount of money to start that development. The General Assembly uh, followed uh, after a presentation to the Joint Legislative Oversight Commission on Education and included two pieces of legislation uh, in subsequent budget bills um, that really impacted assessment in the early grades. So the first, uh, developmental screening and kindergarten entry assessment is included in, in what we know as the Excellent Public Schools Act or the Read to Achieve Act. And if you've heard of the third grade reading proficiency law in North Carolina, uh, this is one provision in that law that speaks to statewide implementation of a kindergarten entry assessment. The second piece is legislation that's been in place since 1985 but was amended uh, to really speak to assessment across kindergarten, first, second, and third grade. And it moved away from just focusing strictly on literacy and math in, the, in a formative way to including multiple domains of development. So in essence, the General Assembly matched legislation to the vision that North Carolina had um, for kindergarten entry assessment and assessment across the early grades. Uh, one thing that they did not match was the timeline. And I think it was Ralph that mentioned uh, the aggressive timeline that Maryland was given. We had er essentially envisioned creating this assessment uh, with beginning implementation in 1617. Uh, the General Assembly felt differently that this should be in place statewide uh, in the 15-16 school year. So next year, we're on a little bit of an accelerated ramp up, um, <clears throat> but we've been given some, some waivers around that to, to make it workable. Um, once we were funded, uh, Superintendent June Atkinson convened a think tank to really uh, get to the nuts and bolts of what this assessment should be in North Carolina. And really three main things came from that think tank. Uh, it was a group of uh, scholars, of practitioners, of central office administrators, uh, university personnel, um, <clears throat> employees of the Department of Public Instruction, and really the recommendations that came forward from that assessment think tank uh, pr proposed claims or really broad learning goals for each domain. Um, it emphasized a focus on the whole child, so we really wanted to get away from just specifically focusing on literacy and math, which is so much of what is uh, considered to be most important in school age programs. And the think tank really wanted to promote the use of formative assessment. So when I talk about the five domains, they're probably all familiar to you, but I, I've listed them here. Approaches to learning, cognitive development, language development, and communication, 
health and physical development, social emotional development. I think it's also important to define formative assessment. Um, I know when I have conversations with others, I can use that term. And if I'm speaking to 10 people, they can have 10 different opinions about what formative assessment means. In fact, formative has, has become sort of a catchphrase or a buzzword that gets attached to lots of different assessment types. And in some ways, all assessment is formative because it can inform instruction. But the definition that we've adopted is one um, that defines formative assessment as a process used by teachers and students during instruction that provides feedback to adjust ongoing teaching and learning to help students improve their achievement of intended instructional outcomes. So I want to highlight the phrase during instruction because this isn't a standalone event. It's not taking a child to the side and doing something specifically. It's not having a testing window that's open for a week, but it is in fact something that should be happening on a daily basis within the context of instruction. And in some ways, the way we talk about this, and I think it's, it's accurate, it's leveraging the best of what good teachers do. Because teachers are constantly assessing their children um, through observation, through questioning, through um, conversation, through collecting work samples, analyzing work samples, et cetera. Um, so this is the definition that we're using. So as, as we've moved forward in constructing this process, um, we've talked a lot about developmental progressions. Uh, in North Carolina, the term we're using is construct progressions. Each of these construct progressions are in fact that. Um, developmental progressions from, least, from less sophisticated skills to very complex that shows how a child would develop towards that broad learning goal. And then assessment means, it's just how is it happening in the classroom? What are teachers doing? What opportunities are being provided? What opportunities exist? that help a teacher um, collect evidence of learning that will then allow them to place a child somewhere on that developmental continuum to know where a child is and where to go next. So in essence, discover where that child is, where's their perfect state at this moment, and how to move them forward. It's, again, I wanna go back to that. This isn't a yes you can or no you can't, it's just where you are, and that, that's a very important thing. I think, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here, I just wanna bump through this, but I wanna point out that there are many ways to, to collect information. Um, we're primarily focusing on situations and tasks, and what's happening in a classroom, and then leveraging family contributions. We really wanna understand what families know about their children and honor that in a way that supports um, this assessment process and a teacher's deep knowledge of a particular child. So situations are intentionally and planned instructional activities uh, designed to help teachers um, learn about students through observation and probing. And then tasks are more individually administered activities that a teacher might use to dig a little deeper on a child that they're not, they're not finding a lot about um, in the context of the classroom. One of the examples I like to often provide um, in a classroom, a kindergarten classroom, for example, you may notice two children in the block center. There might be one child lying on the floor, another child has laid out 15 blocks from the child's feet to his head, and he's counting and he's telling you this child is 15 blocks long. There's a wealth of information you can collect from that experience that happens within the context of the classroom that tells you the child can count from one to 15, has a non-standard use of measurement, um, one-to-one -one correspondence, and then you can kind of get into the social-emotional aspect of the fact that they can operate within the context of a classroom, classroom culture, et cetera. There are lots of things you can take away from that experience that if you collected that information through an anecdotal note, through a short video clip, through a photograph, you have evidence that helps you determine where a child might be on a particular developmental construct. And that's what this process is about. Um, before I get into the family contributions, I want to I talk about where there is a real potential because I think we're seeing this as we're out across the state working in classrooms because the, the, um, the disparity in instructional practices is great um, in North Carolina from, from really good instruction to instruction that is somewhat questionable, right? 
And so if you in, introduce a process like this uh, for assessment, it really forces teachers to think about what are the kinds of opportunities I am providing um, to elicit this, these types of evidences, right? So if I'm a teacher who is very didactic and I stand in front of kids and I talk and then I send them to their seats and ask them to do worksheets, there isn't a lot of opportunity for me to collect authentic examples of, of, of evidence of where they are. So in some ways, it's a, it's a, this is a little bit of a subtle push to improve instructional practices um, across kindergarten classrooms, as well as you know, helping teachers understand who those children are. Um, I think it's important for us to talk about the fact that in North Carolina, as we vision this, we didn't want to think just specifically about kindergarten entry, which is for us a 60-day process. We wanted to, to leverage that process across kindergarten and then first, second, and third grade uh, to really get at pushing up from the early childhood world into um, the grades that have often pushed down into the early childhood world, if that makes sense. Family contributions, um, as, as Catherine mentioned, this is such a critical piece, an important piece to assessing young children, um, just allowing families to tell you what they know about their children. Um, does it get lost in the shuffle as you're, as you're trying to develop something and then roll it out in the, in the time frame that, that is required? Absolutely. Um, so in North Carolina and, and, and other states, you know, this is an iterative process. You know, where we are today in this assessment process is not where we will be uh, a year from now or two years from now or down the road. But initially, <clears throat> what we're, we're really looking at is just uh, presenting some inviting questions for, for families to, to uh, answer that will help teachers um, gain some knowledge about children. So what is, your child's most, what is your child most excited about learning? How does your child typically approach new things? Um, how do you help your child prepare for new experiences? These are the kinds of questions you would hope teachers would ask when they're meeting families for the first time and they're meeting children for the first time, but we, we want to frame it for them. Uh, what does your child like to do at home with family and friends, favorite games, books, etc.? Uh, what are new things you would like your child to learn? Uh, how are these important to you? And what can we do to help your child be successful? I think done properly, this could be the start of building a rapport and a relationship that invites parents into the classroom and, and, and helps them to be part of their children's education and learning because we know that parents that are involved um, is, is a key indicator of a child's success in school age. Um, I have three children in the public schools. They're all much older now. I um, often say I used to know what to do with them when they were young <laughs> because that's where my training is. Now they're all high school and middle school and I don't know what the hell to do with them anymore. <laughs> Sit back and watch. <laughs> but I, I've kind of got off track. Um, what I was going to say there was, you know, when they entered the public schools, I was sort of surprised at, at the wall that schools can put up um, to parent involvement. And so uh, we want to try to change that, provide opportunities that are meaningful and, um, and honored um, beyond just join the PTA and can you sell some wrapping paper at Christmas time. Um, but this is being filmed, so we'll edit that out. <laughs> We did pilot tests this last year. Um, these are kind of the numbers, really working with 5,000 kindergarten students across the state in 248 classrooms. Um, and just, I wanted to give you a sense of what teachers are saying, um, because I think it, you know, it tells us a lot. Because, and we want to hear from teachers as we go through this process, uh, because we're only going to get to a place of developing something that is useful and manageable if we are uh, dealing with the end user and their viewpoint. So they really see the value of a formative process, and they particularly love the whole child focus. Um, you know, that gets them uh, to a place of understanding um, and actually validating their need uh, to recognize supporting the whole child's development. Uh, they appreciate support for motor and emotional social constructs. Um, this is a process that has helped them become more reflective, and that's something we absolutely would want to see. Um, 
they struggle with an assessment that isn't a one-time event. So that, that kind of tells you where we are um, culturally speaking in terms of assessment in, in school age programs. It's, you know, typically it's just something they do uh, with a child or to, <laughs> to a child. Um, and then, and then they're done with it and they move on. So just moving them to this place of understanding this is something that happens constantly is a big hurdle. Um, and professional development, uh, the next bullet point, is absolutely critical. And I would mention, too, um, professional development's critical in, in that the validity, validity of this is all built on the fact that the evidences that teachers might collect support the placement of the child on the, on the construct. So, um, so we have to get to a place where the things that teachers are collecting, and we're not requiring them to collect the same things, they're making those kinds of choices, are the things I, as a, as a teacher, am collecting reflective of, of the placement on the construct, the determination of where that child is? Um, that's a big heavy lift. And then most, I think this is an important fact, they, they worry about how the information will be used. And I think for lots of different reasons. Um, it, it's not so much that it'll be used in an accountable way against children, but an accountable way against them. And if, if you're familiar with the public schools, there have been examples of assessments being used. Uh, initially were introduced as a way to uh, learn more about a child in the classroom, and then it was turned into a measure of student growth that impacted um, a, a, a teacher's uh, evaluation and rating. And so I think they worry about that. So I don't want to go through all of the details, but um, I just thought that would be important to frame North Carolina in this conversation. All right. um, so I'm going to change hats and now. I'll play the role of asking questions, and then uh, after a few, I will um, invite anyone in the audience that has, has a question that you might ask, want to ask. So, um, I think a lot of the time we hear the term school readiness, and maybe like assessment, that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, I want to contrast school readiness or, or what does it mean to be ready for school with this notion of wherever you are is perfect for now. Okay. So in other words, I think people, um, it's not where we want to go, but, but there's this assumption that kids are ready for kindergarten or they're not ready for kindergarten. And if we're putting in place a process that is really about recognizing that wherever you are is perfect, how do you reconcile those two things? So I'll, I'll turn that over to the panel. <laughs> okay, I'll jump in. Do, do they work? Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. All right, so I'm, I'm, I'm an educator, but I'm also working for a State Department of Education, and I'm, of course, to some extent, representing the um, public school community. But there's a big discussion, of course, taking place right now, and that has to do, and you know all about this, is to the fact that we have an inequitable system in our, in our schools. And that is, to me, the key issue about what we're doing early on in early childhood education, is to level the playing field for those kids that would have no other chance other than those quality programs, high quality programs that they attend, and the kind of learning opportunities that we can offer them through good instruction or some good teaching and early learning. That is a, a sort of a mission, uh, I think, that a lot of the school systems are involved in and that education reform is really centered around. So when we talk about school readiness, it is important to find out whether you have on that trajectory that we talked about, kids there that are not ready. We have done the MMSR assessment for 13 years. We've just done a study with it to look at the third and fourth grade outcomes. And what we found out, if the kids come in with a gap, the English language learners, kids with disabilities, low-income kids, coming in with a gap, it widens by third grade. 
there are two questions that come to mind. The first one is, what did we miss in early childhood education and what did the school systems miss during the first three years of their children's um, you know, education? And I don't think that can stand by itself. It needs to be addressed. And that piece of whether we give those kids that do not necessarily get it in a middle class home environment the opportunity to have these learning opportunities that we consider to be good, strong uh, learning opportunities that not only look for recall or look for kids to have certain foundational skills, but also look at the kid's ability to take on a problem and solve it. Those kinds of things are at the forefront, in my mind, and what school readiness is all about. So it is not about an accountability for certain schools or programs. That is not the point. The point is that we're all accountable for these kids to have the skills necessary to engage successfully with the curriculum that's offered in the school. So and it just what it harkens to me is North Carolina's definition in particular of school readiness, which is a three-part puzzle that goes together. So North Carolina, about 15 years ago, defined school readiness as where children are, the readiness of schools to receive them, and the condition of families and communities to help them as they move along. So in some ways, I think of it as from the child component, wherever you are is perfect, but when we look at the other pieces of that readiness puzzle, you know, what's that child data telling us about is wherever the rest of the puzzle is, is it perfect? So I see f an, a difference between thinking about individual children and wherever you are is perfect, and teachers using that data to help them move along the progression. But at a bigger picture, across our children, collectively, you know, what is it saying about our families and communities in early childhood? our schools and where they are. Yeah, I, I think that's a really useful perspective, Catherine. I mean, I was going back to, you know, if you stay in education long enough, it's like fashion. You know, I keep my platform heels since in the 70s and then finally they'll come back. <laughs> Except my feet have grown a lot bigger. Um, so that is an issue. But, but, you know, when I first started teaching a gazillion years ago, we used to talk about school readiness, and then we stopped talking about school readiness and started talking about schools being ready for children. And I worry that we're going back to this more judgmental. I mean, I appreciate what Catherine said. I think that's a very nuanced and sensitive interpretation of school readiness. But I'm not sure, based on what I've seen in other states, that that is actually the perspective that's being taken. And it seems to me where, I mean, yes, we need to hold our communities accountable, our opportunities for children uh, need to be there. But at the same time, I really worry that we're going back to a more, you know, which I began in, this judgmental perspective on children and their families, that you're not ready. Um, I wish we could find another term, then you're not ready, because I think you're already starting with a deficit model. Uh, when you know, we've tried to shift that perspective and you know you can say well it's just semantics but actually it's powerful because I do think it's setting to kids up you're not ready so you're coming in as something that's not ready um, and, I, and I do think that's very different from wherever you are is perfect and it's the job of, of everybody involved in the growth and development of children to make sure that they um, succeed and they have opportunities but I, I do think we're at risk and certainly some states thing I've seen you know within the th first three months of kindergarten you're failing you know you're failing reading well that to me is just ludicrous and it, it's it's done in this in the context of kindergarten readiness and I've actually seen that on on a couple of in a couple of documents from states um, and so I think we we have to be very cautious and if everybody could think like North Carolina, that would be great, um, or Maryland, but I'm, I'm not seeing it out there, and I think, I, I think this is a deficit model in the making, if not fully baked. Thank you. Um, you know, as states develop kindergarten entry assessments, they're creating data points. And in fact, one of the things that we didn't talk about uh, 
both in the race to the top, early learning challenge uh, requirements and in North Carolina and the legislative requirement, there's, there is the reality that at the end of 60 days, the child profile that is created, certain data points will be um, loaded into the state longitudinal database in the aggregate. Um, there are some advantages to that. The state certainly wants to look at cohorts of children as they come in, um, as they come into kindergarten. Um, but what are, what, are the, what are the potential misuses, uh, misuses of that? And how do we guard against that? Of, of misuses of data that exist, and how do we guard against that? Well, the first misuse is not to use it, first of all. <laughs> so then the second one would be exactly what, what we just heard, is that it's not used for um, identifying gaps or uh, using it as a basis for support, but using it to judge kids and then, or use it even worse for any placements um, and for kids, say, special ed or other placements, or use that as a basis for making s um, or <coughs> introducing that kind of approach. Um, yeah, I think that the, the data that's being used is also subject to interpretation, and so I think it's very important that whoever, whatever state is engaged in that has a communication plan with respect to how the, the data is being used and what it, for instance, you know, we have local early childhood councils in our state and um, just beef those up through the race to the top. They're going through a results-based accountability leadership program. They are um, charged with really taking this on and improving the conditions in early childhood education for all these kids. And so the data is really with uh, one piece of information that they can use to be informed about their strategic plan in improving early childhood education in their jurisdiction. And that's, the, uh, in my view, a very proper use because it is meant to address something that needs to be addressed. And the earlier, the better. Mm. I, I agree with that. I think that would be a very useful use. Um, if you're looking at um, a pattern or a trend to get some bigger picture rather than looking at individuals. So I think it can be very useful for that purpose. But I'd also want to ask these people who are busy shoving numbers in a longitudinal data system what they want to use it for. Um, you know, I, I sound terribly negative, and I'm not really, but I think we have a lot to be concerned about because states have spent gazillions of dollars on these longitudinal data systems. I mean, tons and tons of money. And so I'd want to know from them what, what do they want to use it for? Why is there all this effort to put it in there? And if it is to do some of these misuses, then they need to be redirected into ways in which they can think more longitudinally and look at cohorts and patterns and trends and look for ways in which it can inform, I mean, data should inform decisions. And the kinds of decisions that these kind of data can inform are what professional supports or funding or resources need to be in place to shore up areas that clearly need to be shored up, not looking at individual children. So in my, from my perspective, uh, the worry is not on the what are we doing with it, but on the collecting it side. And it boils down to time, mm -hmm. because I see a lot of states being pressured, you heard it, um, to put these systems in place and not having the time and resources to really understand the credibility of the data. Were the teachers actually trained well enough to do this? And I think that it just comes down to a pushback of we're not going to do anything with the data until we know we can trust it and that it's credible. And I know that folks in John's role and Rolf's role get a lot of pressure, but I'm hoping that as a field we will support the message that you can't do anything with this data until we know that it's credible, that the teachers have been trained, they're doing it well, and we can trust it. Because otherwise, decisions get made based on data that is wrong. And mm -hmm. so that's my worry. Yeah, the adage, garbage in, garbage out, really applies to the um, data system. Mm -hmm. 
It's an important point. Um, I wanted to open it up the floor now uh, to any questions you might have. There's a microphone in the middle. Uh, so if anybody has a question they would like to ask the panel, please come forward and ask away. See someone coming. Hi, I'm very interested in, um, there was a book that was put up on the slide called Assessment for Learning and Development. Um, I wondered if that book is going to be available. I'm very interested in it at a personal level. I do a lot of work in elementary schools where children are brought to kindergarten and they are assessed first week by a stranger. They are asked to recite as many letters as they can in a minute. Um, they are asked to count to 100 as fast as they can in a minute. Um, one story that I will never forget is a student who went across the hallway um, from a preschool program and was labeled at risk because she couldn't identify a certain amount of letters within that minute. This child, this child left preschool knowing all upper and lower case letters. It was her personality, it was her demeanor, her way of being that she just wasn't a fast child. Her father is that way. I, I have so many stories like that that really concern me and so I would like to take away and take back to some of these schools um, some resources on developmentally appropriate assessment. So. so I think the book you're referring to was the report of the North Carolina Task Force. Um, yes. And that is available on, on North Carolina Department of Public Instruction's website. If you go to the Office of Early Learning, uh, there is a link that you can, you can reach. Or you can send me an email and I can make sure that I get it to you. Um, you know, I think you make an important point in, in the process that, that we're imploring um, or implementing over six, is over 60 days, and it's within the context of instruction. So in some ways, we hope we're dealing with the acclimation to school issue. Uh, I, I know, you know, having been a pre-kindergarten teacher as well and assessing children um, to gain entrance into Title I preschool, um, the very same thing happened. You know, Three-year-old children would come to a school they'd never been to, meet someone they had never seen, be taken down the hallway into a huge cafetorium with 15 tables and lots of kids and lots of adults, and, hey, you just happened to land at Motor Skills, so I'm going to throw some bean bags at you. And so, you know, are you really getting a good sense of who that child is? Um, in you know, in many cases, the answer is is no, and so I think, I think you know, the more that we can sort of push this realization that um, children need to become part of the school classroom and community, um, you're going to get a truer read of who that child is, and and that's why we've kind of moved to this this place with assessment, and I don't want to run on, but I think it also points to the fact that. There is, you've sort of exposed one big value to a statewide kindergarten entrance assessment. Uh, it, it moves us away from North Carolina with 115 school districts doing 115 different things to children as they come through the door. Um, and it takes us to a place where we're doing something consistent statewide that is developmentally appropriate. So thank you. Hello. Um, I'm actually very glad you went first because that question um, really frames my question uh, well. Um, so I'm, I'm new to the early childhood field and uh, I'm finding this conversation really fascinating because I didn't know a lot about this and my role as a regional coordinator for a um, early childhood council uh, is to help the, the community engage in this issue. So I'm fascinated with the idea of uh, uh, wherever you are, you're perfect for now and the idea that the early childhood field can actually help to push up um, its uh, knowledge and expertise um, and rather than the push down from the K-12 and where that alignment might happen. So my question is, where do the children fit in in um, informing that process? So w I, I wonder where the children fit in terms of 
in these classroom settings, how can they play a role in directing how um, assessment is, uh, is used and how things can change, right? You know, their, you know um, feeding off of their curiosity and, and what they bring to the world as, 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 as little humans. So um, I, I'm wondering where, where the children fit in that. That's that's a great topic because it gets at the notion of what what does a, an assessment or formative assessment look like. So the indirect measures that we talked about, the observational measures, are probably a bit, the best tool for that group because the kids at at age four or five show tell you by by their play, by their engagement with materials and so on and forth, what they know. So the key to then developing a formative assessment is to give the teacher a tool to see what is it that I'm looking at and what will it tell me. If a, if a kid scribbles something on a piece of paper or a child is trying to draw certain lines, there's a, a huge difference in terms of child development and learning taking place there. And that's something that needs to be sort of, um, through training and other means, explain to teachers in what it is they're looking for to determine whether the kids are really progressing. That's the, that's the notion. Um, when it comes to standardized items, although we're using them now in the KRA, the standardized items are not as good because you, you big, put the child in a position where they need to respond just for certain items. And uh, we use it for foundational things just some very quick things to go through, but it is, um, so it's a direct measure. You know, you don't wait for the child to show it to you in the block play or in other means to get some of the foundational skills. It's a big, I think it's a big discussion. Margaret is probably involved in this, in the development of some of those tools. Uh, observational rubrics is really the way to go, I think, in terms of working with kids in the classroom and, and um, there's whole science behind it. I think I'm going to interpret your question <coughs> slightly differently from Rolf, from the perspective of the actual child involvement in the assessment process. Um, I think in the K-12 arena, there's a lot, an emerging focus on that, as we recognize, you know, for this big push for college and career readiness, that it's not just being, um, having academic knowledge and be able to use academic knowledge, but it's other skills such as giving and receiving feedback, metacognition, being able to monitor your own learning, being self-directing. Some of the things that have been around in early childhood as long as, as I've certainly been familiar with the field. Um, and I think that's becoming more overt now, and it seems to me that it's perfectly possible in early childhood settings to involve children in understanding what the goal of their learning is, to engage in conversations with them about where they think they are in their learning. I've seen some very good examples of four and five-year-olds uh, giving feedback to each other, provided they're supported and they're trained and it's modeled to them. So I think these are aspects of involvement in the assessment process that we're seeing a lot more of in the K-12 arena that I think can fit very naturally um, and intentionally into an early childhood context. We have just a few more minutes. I want to get to all the questions that we have. So, um. all right. uh, Thank you. The professional development aspect, um, I'm from a county that has, I think it's like the fifth largest school system in North Carolina. Just had a meeting last week and they've already set their professional development calendar for next year and was wondering what the logistics are for rolling out the professional development aspect and is there some, are there some lessons learned from folks who've been there, done that before as well? I mean, specific to North Carolina, what the department has been doing um, since I guess late January, early February, is working with district implementation teams. And so what we are doing is developing a team at the local level that will be responsible for implementation um, of the KEA process so that, in fact, it, it can outlive the longevity of the grant that's funding the professional development. So we're, we focus a lot of attention on sort of building local capacity to deliver. Um, I would mention that the timeline that's in place uh, has been particularly challenging for 
uh, large districts, less so for smaller districts. Um, we've been given some flexibility uh, in this upcoming year um, for districts to, um, in, in some ways, just experiment with this process. So while they're being asked to collect information on language and communication and evidences of, of learning around um, object counting and cognition, um, the other developmental domains, um, they're being encouraged to explore and examine over the course of the year so that a, a full ramp up of the KEA will happen in the following year. So um, all that to say it's all very aggressive and all very challenging and uh, we try to deal with it as we can. Thank you. I'm from Tulsa, Oklahoma, and um, actually, uh, this is kind of more of a, <clears throat> a comment than a question, but we, on a very small scale in Tulsa, are really working hard on that birth through eight continuum, and we've started a very small program, a pilot year, that um, we're working with families with that birth through three to really help them understand the continuum of things that they're doing with the little ones. For instance, an eight-month-old picking up a Cheerio with their pincer grasp actually leads to picking up a fork to eat, which someday leads to picking up a pencil to write, and that that's all part of literacy. So we've kind of started a campaign called Making the Connection. We're, working, we're using the Ages and Stages questionnaire as a learning tool, not as a they can or they can't do it, mm -hmm. but it's being, it's being used in a lot of different ways. We've started an online screening um, website and we're presenting at 1.30 if anybody wants to hear about mm -hmm. it. It's our little ad. But it's been very kind of slow, but as we've rolled it out, we're getting more and more you know, play on it because it's, it's like there's so much that happens before we get to where you're talking about that helping teachers and families and grandparents and everybody, providers, understand that continuum of development, those things back here do lead to better outcomes up here, but sometimes they just don't realize there's a connection there. So mm -hmm. anyway. That's an excellent comment. I think the research is very clear that, that early matters <laughs> and birth through grade three, the continuum is very critical. And if you want success, I mean, I think that's one of the points that we make in North Carolina around the Read to Achieve law. If you want children reading proficiently at grade three, you need to be doing a whole lot of stuff way sooner than third grade mm -hmm. to make sure that that happens. Good morning. Uh, after spending my career in the K-12 environment, I retired and got involved in early child education. I'm chair of a pre-K committee in Forsyth County, North Carolina, and we spent a lot of time talking about getting kids prepared for school. My first question is, is this model, which I like a lot, uh, being pushed down, so to speak, to the, the pre-K program, the formative assessment, so we can use formative assessment tools uh, to prepare our children for school? Um, that's the first question. The second question, as a parent and grandparent, <clears throat> every state, including North Carolina, has a cutoff date. Some kids start kindergarten at five years and one month. Mm -hmm. Some start at five years and 364 days. I live in an environment where upper middle class parents are delaying entry of their children based upon their personal family assessment that mm -hmm. their child is not ready because they have a late birthday. They're five years and one week. As a K-12 administrator, that began to trouble me because I saw the achievement gap getting worse. People of high education means are getting their kids a leg up by starting school <coughs> instead of at five years, one week. They started six years one week. Uh, so this preparedness thing is a problem when we divide kids into age cohorts and then fit each foot into this unfitting shoe. So that's my comments, questions, and I'll take you. <laughs> I'll speak to the assessment piece in pre-kindergarten. So I, I think it, the reality is, is lots of early childhood programs are utilizing an assessment that, that may be very similar uh, teaching strategies gold is one example. Um, I think one of the things we have to recognize is that there are other professionals in the lives of a child that have a wealth of information about the children that they serve. We need to build some credible way to get that information from those teachers to 
kindergarten teachers receiving those children. You think, could it be, happen digitally? It could possibly happen digitally. It, a, a better process may be just working with parents and strengthening their ability to bring that information forward to inform the teacher that is receiving their child. So I, I think we're trying to think through those things, but yeah, you make a critical point. Hi, I'm from Harnett County, and I guess my first question kind of was along the lines of his question as well about um, the, especially in reference to NC Pre-K, um, well, first, first my question would be, because I apologize, I came in late, so this may be a, a, an irrelevant question for everybody else who knows, but um, is this going to be something that in 15-16 it'll be a requirement for children as they enter kindergarten, or is it, that's my first question. Yeah, the aspects of it in the 15-16 year are a requirement with an expectation that 16-17 it will be rolled out statewide across all domains, yes. And then, so how will that work with, does that mean that all private child care centers and schools and NC pre-K programs will be on board with using this assessment and have the training to administer it? Well, this assessment happens at kindergarten entry, so it's, it's with the kindergarten teacher going forward. Oh, okay. So mm -hmm. I misunderstood. I right. thought this would be actually happening leading up to kindergarten. Right. No, it, for North Carolina, it's at kindergarten entry through third grade is the okay. process. All right. All right. Well, thank, um, maybe time for one more quick one, because we're actually just a few minutes past noon, but um, I appreciate people staying put. Um, I'm really taken with what you were saying about uh, ready for school versus, um, versus perfect where they are. Um, and I'm really curious about where and how progress is being made on schools being ready for children, and in particular in terms of um, skills for teachers kindergarten through grade three, in terms of really taking developmental perspective and being able to differentiate curriculum for children where they are. Right. So it's, it's challenging. As I mentioned, there's 115 school districts. North Carolina is a local control state. So decisions get made at the local level about implementation of uh, instructional practices, et cetera. Um, you know, what we find is that we have our champions across the state that are really embracing uh, the direction that we're going. And then we have LEAs that sort of push back pretty significantly saying, you know, you're taking us back 20 years, we're academic. Um, and so, you know, it's a learning process, but I, I think as we go through the professional development, I, I want to reflect back to the comment I made earlier. If a teacher is teaching and they're recognizing and they begin to recognize that I'm not really providing opportunities to collect authentic examples of, that will help me determine where a child is on these developmental constructs, then maybe I need to change something about what I'm doing in the classroom. Um, we have a lot of different efforts. It was mentioned earlier, we work pretty closely with first school. That's a whole process about improving the instructional practices. That's one component is improving instructional practices in, in, in grades pre-K through grade three. And it really looks at you know, what, how children are spending their time, how engaged they are. And you notice these huge discrepancies between a child's day in pre-kindergarten and a child's day in kindergarten and you use that information to have conversations with teachers, grade level teams, across grade level teams, and, and really help move the needle on more appropriate instruction. So it's a challenge, but it's a work that's underway. Um, I just wanna say thank you again to Dr. Uh, Rolf Grofwaner, Dr. Margaret Heritage, Dr. Catherine Scott Little for allowing me to share the stage with them. Uh, truly pioneers and experts in the field of assessment. So I'm privileged to be with them and learn from them. Um, and I hope you would thank them as well. And thank you for your great participation today.